Welcome back. This is Arise News. You're watching The Morning Show with me, Biola Labi. Anthony Bourdain was an American celebrity chef, author, travel documentarian, and television personality who starred in programs focusing on the exploration of international culture, cuisine, and the human condition. He was considered one of the most influential chefs in the world by many commentators. Let's take a quick look at a chat we had with CNN, with a chat he had with his CNN colleague, Anderson Cooper, on his Vietnam trip, Dining with Obama. So this upcoming episode is in one of my favorite cities in Hanoi. I went to, to school in Hanoi. I went to the University of Hanoi for six months back in the last six months of the U.S. embargo, basically, in 91. Mm -hmm. There were no cars in the city. It's right. completely changed now. You know, Hanoi has changed, but the bones are still there. Right. I mean, the things that you probably loved about the place are still there. The French architecture, right, the yeah, boulevards, the smell of Vietnam that grabs you and keeps you forever. And all the, like, the food stands on the, the street. The food stands, and, the street culture, um, the sensibility, the colors. And, I mean, did you find, because when I was there in 91, there really, there weren't many Americans. There were a handful mm -hmm. of us actually living in Hanoi at the time, but... Um, People would talk about the war, but, but they were also incredibly curious about Americans. Now more than ever. Um, I mean, most of the country are young. Most of the living Vietnamese have no recollection. They weren't alive for the war. It, it, it's more and more every day an abstraction. Um, many, many, many American veterans of the war go back and find themselves ex just devastated by how welcome they are. Liver, it's yeah. good for you. Okay. Oh, wow. Beautiful. With a quail's egg on top? Wow, that's cool. An egg in anything makes it better. <laughs> Never seen a quail's egg. No. Yeah. And it's like a tiny little egg. It's like a little baby egg. <laughs> wow, that looks great. That is... It's, uh... it's going to change your worldview, my friend. <laughs> so good. You sat down with President Obama. You went out to a meal with President Obama. Mm -hmm. How cool was that? We've been secretly planning this for some time, colluding. Uh -huh. No one knew. The uh -huh. network didn't know. Uh, the camera people didn't know. Uh, very few people outside of a small group at the White House knew. We've been looking to do something. And when we heard that uh, the president was planning... Whose idea was it? Was it your idea? Was White it? House called. Really? They're like, we like the show and we'd love to have the president do something with you? I don't know the exact wording, but right. for whatever reason, cool. um, they seem to, he seemed willing to play. And um, my feeling was if we're going to do this, we should do it right. I mean, we shouldn't be sitting in a banquet room at the Hilton. We should do what we do, which is hang out in some working class place. So, did uh, people in the restaurant know he was about to pop in? No one knew ever that. that wow. You know, in five minutes, the president is going <laughs> to roll. The president of the United so States is going to roll up. Did people flip out? They flipped, uh, and really, one of the one of the great one of the great things that came out of it was the reaction of ordinary Vietnamese and people. You're not loving your liver, but it's good for you, like my mother used to say, as she approached me with something terrifying. So, thank you so much again, Doctor, for being on um, for coming back. Um, you were here last week raising awareness about mental health, and unknowingly, we had no idea that within one week, two high-profile celebrities will commit suicide. And I think why this is so poignant and important is because they weren't just celebrities in their own country. They were global celebrities. Yeah. They were worldwide celebrities. Mm -hmm. They touched all of our lives. Anthony Bourdain was on. Um, had a show on CNN that transcended CNN. It was a show that went around the world. And he took you with him on these journeys. Mm -hmm. um, and we also have something we'll be showing later of him actually in Nigeria. So this is why this was so... This affected people in a way and actually started a conversation locally. And I wanted to start by asking you, when you see someone like that, mm. Um, someone that everyone wants to have his life. Every, mm. I mean, every single tribute that I've heard was that, you know, um, men want to be him, women want to be with him. How does someone, how do you, how do you understand what that means for someone like him to take his life? It just goes to reinforce the fact that um, success doesn't equate to happiness, neither does wealth equate to happiness. And that when people think that um, those that are depressed, um, they are lonely at 1 a.m., they could be depressed at 1 p.m. when they are with everybody and they are smiling and laughing. Mm. So it, we, we need to understand the integrity why people 
do take their lives. And then the fact that we need to go back and change the narrative to have a culture of compassion. For us to, to start changing the narrative and telling ourselves that we, we should actually put ourselves in other people's shoes. We should actually listen to understand, not listen to talk. We should actually learn how to show empathy. We should actually learn how to check on ourselves, our neighbors, and also have what we call self-preservation, and then seek help and encourage help-seeking behavior. Mm. I think all these you know, play a major role in how we should see how you know, the normalizing mental health and making people understand that, yes, things happen. Sometimes bad things happen to good people. Mm. It's not because of a weakness of character, or maybe because they are going through some life challenges or some disorders. One, I mean, um, so one of the things, just just a warning at home, we are going to be talking about suicide and sensitive issues, so please um, be aware, and if you're watching with a child, please take note. Um, both, both, um, both of the celebrities that died this week, um, last week, yeah. both had children yeah. that were, I think, mo I think mm -hmm. both of them are actually 13. How do you explain to a child what has just happened to their parent? Ah. That now goes to what we, we always talk about in medicine, predisposing factor. Now, automatically, these children, they've been given a predisposing factor, death of a parent. Meaning that, you know, as they grow and they become adults, if any trigger or any precipitant comes up, they can actually break down because they are already now known to be in that space of being at risk. So, mm. yes, they're already at risk now because they didn't, they didn't just lose their parents, but the fact that in a traumatic way, internet wouldn't forget, Google wouldn't forget. Sure, they are sure. teenagers, they are going to be, they are very much aware that this is what happened to my mom, this is what happened to my dad. And then they're going to be able to maybe grieve over it, or they may even have what we call the post-traumatic stress disorder. Mm. So maybe one of them, they both may even go into what we call depression. Some of them may even start having issues with trust. You no, know, having relationship problems like, oh, I thought my mom had everything all together. She was my role model. She was, everything was all, you know, prim and proper, but she took her own life. Mm. Will I ever forgive myself? What if I'm the reason why she took her life? So all that boils down to like, once there's a suicide case in a, in a family, it affects everyone. Because the person is living behind loved ones, families, um, relatives, colleagues. So it's a huge burden. And that is why you know, su suicide is a public health related problem whereby we all must be aware of the warning signs and things that we should watch out for when we think somebody may be suicidal. Because it doesn't equate to the fact that every suicide case, the person must have a mental illness. Mm. So I just want, because um, there are children, I mean, when people have children and when you're the one yeah. left behind, yeah. what can you do to help those, the, the child that has just lost one of the parents <sighs> sort of begin to understand or cope? Or how do you need to be much more alert when you're dealing with that kid? Um, for, for children, definitely, um, if it's in a society like us, it's different from the very developed countries. Mm -hmm. In societies like ours, we're going to look at, oh, they may, their children, they don't really need support. They will grieve over it and time will go. No, we need to understand there's what we call psychological debriefing, where that child or the children in that home will need to be, you know, counseled, supported, you know, guided and encouraged in the sense that um, their schoolwork, their relationship with themselves and their relationship with other people may be altered. Some may get withdrawn, while some may have outbursts of anger. So you need to watch out on those. Why you go through counseling with them and they go through therapy sessions. It, we are not saying they must or they will definitely have psychological issues. We are just putting a, you know, preventive measures. So they should be allowed to grieve. Mm. Because mm. there was what they call delayed grief. And mm. delayed grief is also not good for, mm. for anybody, whether you are a child. Knowing fully well that there are statistics that shows that half of mental illnesses start before the age of 13 and uh, before the age of 14, why to talk before the age of 24? Mm. So if these are teenagers, 
and they still fall within this half of mental illness that commence before the age of 13. We need to make sure that oh, they are wow. delicate. Yes. They are very yes. delicate. You need to yeah. make sure that you they watch out for any warning signs. They are supported, allowed to grieve. The, the support system that they, they need must be very healthy, you know, because they may have sleep disturbances sure. and you no know, appetite changes, mood swings, you no know, guilt feelings, they may be crying. So all that must be looked into to support them so that they would grow up to be healthy mm. and be more psychologically minded. I mean, I think our, our prayers and um, wishes go out to the children exactly. because at the end of the day, they've left children behind. Yeah. Um, up next is one of Anthony Bourdain's last interview where he may have given some signs. Let's take a quick look. Look, uh, uninhibited creative freedom is something that I've been incredibly fortunate to, to have for the better part of my entire television career. Uh, unlike anyone else I know of in television, uh, I've been free to do whatever I want, um, to make the shows I want anywhere I want, with whom I want, in, in any style I want. So I, at first, I don't know any other way. And by now, I won't have it any other way. Um, life is good. Why settle for less? Um, and by the same token, uh, when you're given that much freedom and you're, you, you have essentially no interference and nothing but support behind you, um, what you don't want to do is get lazy and bored and sloppy. Uh, to me, I'd much rather not make TV at all uh, or make even f unsuccessful TV than make competent television. You know, it's very easy to make a conventional travel or food show at this point. It's, it's like shooting porn. It's the same shot sequence and the same sort of limited uh, terminology. Uh, you know how all of the little pieces work, where you have to start and where you have to end. Um, I detest competent, workmanlike storytelling. And I'm always very, you know, the times that we, we, we do that, I'm, I'm very unhappy with that. I'd rather, I'd rather fail. To be perfectly honest, most of the people I've met who've been in the television industry for a long time, their greatest fear is that they will not be in the television industry next year. That they'll say something or do something or make a decision that will be so unpopular that they will lose their gig and won't end up back on television again. I, I don't have that fear. You know, I, while I admit I, I wouldn't particularly enjoy going back to cooking short order, um, I know I can. <laughs> if I have to, I, I, I'm pretty sure I could keep up on an omelet station. I've been fired many times my, in my cooking career. Uh, I've been fired a number of times. I was not a particularly good chef. Uh, I had a lot of problems at various points of my career with narcotics. Um, I was very deservedly uh, fired on a number of occasions. Um, but I mean, if you're talking about failure, uh, the, the, you know, I accepted failure as a chef because I was, at various times, a bad chef, or even a bad person. Uh, these days, if I fail, it's because I tried to do something and did not succeed, or I, I just was not able to do uh, what I hoped to do or wanted to do. Or maybe I tried to do something that just clearly, in retrospect, didn't work, but I would much rather that I would much rather fail gloriously than not venture, not try. Um, I'm not in, as I said before, I'm not interested in, in competent, making, telling, telling stories with, with competence. I'm looking to tell them with some style and originality and some creativity that is interesting to me and the people I work with. And there have been times that that, that has resulted in, in, in failure, uh, meaning it didn't work, it didn't communicate anything like what I wanted to. 
often the story I think I'm going to get ends up being another story entirely that's even better or, or very different. That's good. But there were other times where I just failed miserably. You know, I tried to do a Sicily show again, and, and, and it was not good. It did not capture the place. It did not, didn't show us anything of value. It, it did not live up to its, the subtlety and beauty of its subject, including powerful uh, women storytellers, for instance. Um, that, is a, that is something in which the show has lacked frequently. Uh, it's something that we're, we consciously try to do better at, but, but it's also something that we fail at. Um, you know, if you see a show that's all men talking, that's not a tendency or um, uh, a predilection on my part. It, it's, it's a failure. It means, for whatever reason, we failed to find or convince uh, women in a particular country where often culturally that's difficult, but it's no excuse to, uh, to open up to us. Um, I think that's something we fail at probably more regularly, regrettably, than anything else. Well, thank you. Um, seeing that you, so that, that could be interpreted in so many different ways. Exactly. I mean, Sorry. it could be someone that is, you can interpret that as someone that is extremely well adjusted, that embraces failure. failure. You can interpret that as someone that is very difficult on themselves and very self critical. Exactly. And um, I mean, he's self deprecating in that, he's self critical, he's very judgmental yeah, of his own self exactly. and when it comes to failure. Yeah. Um, so in a way, it almost feels like you can't really know what's going on with people. It, it, and that, that goes to show that, you know, when people always think that, when you die from suicide, you, you, you must be depressed. No, because there are other reasons why people can, you know, mm. you know take their own life. Yeah, that, that can transcend to the fact that, look, I've, I'm well adjusted because I've, I've known I've failed a lot of times and mm. um, I'm not happy about it. Mm. But could they have been going through some level of depression at that point? Mm. But it may not have even been depression, it may be a personality thing. Some people that die from suicide are impulsive. It does, you know, I'm tired of this thing, it's not working, and then because it's a personality thing, they take their life. Why some people it's not even because of they are being impulsive or they are depressed, they may be psychotic. What we mean by that is that, you know, they hear voices that are commanding, they're telling them to harm themselves. Why some people it's because of they are abusing drugs. Mm. I want to yeah. actually shift gears because I want us to talk about yeah. drug abuse. Yeah. One of the things he was very open about is his use of narcotics and um, how he used that, you know, for a lot of times of his yeah. life and how he wasn't always a good person when he was exactly. doing that. Exactly, exactly. Um, when the brain inter in sort of intercepts with narcotics, what mm. happens to the brain? What is happening in that point? Oh, we have what we call something in the brain, we call neurotransmitters. We have the serotonin, we have the dopamine. So dopamine plays a major role here. Dopamine is a control of our motivation, it's a control of our um, um, movement, it's a control of pleasure, it's a control of this, the feeling good. That, so that's that feeling. dopamine. That's dopamine. So, um, there's a reward center in the brain that, you know, in a normal dosage, it will just reward your normal activities that you do. But when people take drugs, irrespective of whether it is cocaine, marijuana, whichever drug, it's released excessively. So it goes to the reward center and then reinforces all everything. So they are aesthetic, they are euphoric, and it gives that force you know, um, euphoria mm. in the brain. So the, it, that trains the brain for people to go back to taking what make, gives them this feeling. Mm, mm. So this is, you see, see how the brain then reacts to substance. So the person may be taking it as a regular user or for fun. Okay. So it, it just reinforces those euphoric feeling, pleasure, motivation, feeling good. And then because you don't know, because you tell yourself, I know when to stop. I know sure. when I don't want to, I will not take it. You become a regular user. Then gradually, because the person, the person may become addicted. Maybe because he may be going through some midlife crisis, some failures that he has been talking about. And then, you know, there's that thing that gives him that pleasure, that rewards his behavior and all that. 
it then transcends and crosses the line and then becomes so a problem. So that's sort of what happens with dopamine, dopamine, but you didn't tell us what happens with serotonin. No, before. serotonin doesn't really play so much okay. in, when it comes to because um, dopamine is the one that is the... That um, gives you the, the, that's the feeling, the fun. That's the, the, fun, fun. That's the fun drug. Exactly. That's so, the fun, so that's the fun we, home. So people yeah. will talk about the dopamine is sex. So people, mm. so people will talk about dopamine is addiction. Mm. So people will talk about dopamine is uh, pleasure. Mm. So dopamine is the real, the one we really you know, nip in the board when it comes to everything that... So I want to bring this down to home. So there's been recent talks of drug addictions, especially with codeine. Mm. Help me understand what happens when you take codeine in the brain and in this reward system. It's, 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 a, it's all about the same pathway. It's, it's all about that motivation, um, um, pleasure, feeling good, even movement. So, that, so dopamine is complicated in so many things. Movement, motivation, pleasure. So you can imagine when somebody takes any, any of these substances, some of them mimic what, where the dopamine, so if you want to go medicate, it's a bit quite, there's what we call the synapse. So dopamine, they, they, they move from one end to another. And so you can imagine if somebody takes um, any of these substances and then it affects their movement. Mm. So, so you know that dopamine is also affected because apart from the Pleasure it also affects um, motivation. It also affects movement. So if some mimic those that, that pathway. Sure, sure, sure. Why some you know is the excessive release in that goes to the reward center, the reward circuit, and then of course the euphoria and the pleasure and everything. So it's all complicated, irrespective of the, any of the substance that you are taking. Mm. So the dopamine is the like the the main issue that we deal with when it comes to the brain. That. And I, I have one last question on this before we move on, because I think this is a really important yeah. topic to talk about, and I don't yeah. want to just sort of gloss exactly. over it and move on to something else. When I, what I really want to ask you is, for someone who, had, who has been very open about the mm. use of narcotics, yeah. how can that, and especially when they were younger, how could that have an effect on you as you get older in life? Oh, as you get, you know, as we get older, every organ in the body also gets old. Mm. So um, for him, if he started quite early as a teenager, the brain is automatically going through matru maturation, is immature. So whatever you take at that point, it kind of affects the brain more because there are different reasons why people even want to even do drugs sure. as a younger age group. Some want to experiment. Why some want to just do it to fit in because they want to belong to a group. Why some use it to feel good? feel good, maybe they, they are shy, they have anxiety issues, they are depressed, they feel good. Some want to use it to feel better. Sure. Why some, you no, know, they just use it to enhance performance. So it's and several reasons. And just a quick key point you're saying here yeah. is that the brain is not fully mature. Exactly. And so you're actually causing real trauma real to the trauma, brain. Real trauma, yes. So some, you know, as they grow, they are great, but some, it damages the brain, and then the, that still goes back to the statistics that half before the age of 13 and to third mental illness before the age of 24. So by the time you're seeing the infect at 30, 35, there already are issues that you know, the brain will have gone through some level of damage. Mm, yeah. Mm, mm. All right, we're gonna take a quick break. When we return, we'll be talking about celebrities who have been open about depression, anxiety, and all sorts of mental health problems. Welcome back. This is Arise News. You're watching The Morning Show with me, Biola Labi. Celebrities look flawless on the red carpet, TV, and near screens. However, many of them over the years have put their perfect image aside and spoken up about mental health, depression, anxiety, obsessive compulsive disorders to bring awareness to the issues. These celebrities include a Grammy award-winning artist, Adele, Beyonce, Ellen DeGeneres, and even here at home, people like Mo Cheda recently spoke up about her struggles as well. Doctor, just looking at this, I mean, really starting with Anthony Bourdain, starting with Kate Spade, these are people that, I mean, they're always ready for the camera. Exactly. They're spending their lives in front of the camera. Yeah. And then to see other people that have come out and really been open mm -hmm. about mental health issues, people like Ellen DeGeneres, yeah. people like Jim Carrey, especially comedians. Exactly. People always don't expect that from comedians. Exactly. What do you make of all this? It does go to show that no, there's no immunity. 
No one has as absolute immunity when it comes to our mental health. No one has as um, there's no vaccine yet that has been manufactured to say yes, there's this vaccine. Once you take it, you are immune. It just goes to let us understand that our physical health is as important as our mental health rather is as important as our physical health. So we need to understand that it's not another part of us. It is part of us, and we need to take that as important and, of course, learn what to do in ensuring that we bridge the gap between our mental health, which we all have, to our mental illness, which we do not all have, and understand what it means to have mental awareness. Do you think people in, front, people in the public life have a higher, run a higher risk of depression? Uh, they, they, are, they are not really at higher risk. It's just that they are in that space where there's a lot of pressure. They're, they're kind of uh, made to have that kind of forced life, even if they're dealing with challenges. And then ability for people to understand and um, support them is not really there because they just believe that they ha all have it all together. So to an extent, um, we're telling ourselves that we need to build the culture of compassion mm. and ability to listen. Because it's good for us to listen, to understand that people may be dealing with challenges and supporting pressure on people, and then we take away the statement of what we people see. Mm. Kate said it. Mm. And you can imagine Kate, married for over 20 years, has a daughter, has a multi-billion dollar company, she telling the sister, what will people say? If I go seek for help, it will affect my brand. It's really absurd because it's, it's a common statement here in Nigeria mm. that people just you know, want to wish it away and say, no, what will people say? I'm going to be affected. People will not take me seriously. Even when we get corporate organizations to help in creating awareness when it comes to mental health, mm -hmm. they rather go anonymous. They don't mm. want to, to go out there and say, look, I'm this brand supporting mental awareness. What will people say? They will think I have somebody in my family that has mental illness or I'm dealing with mental health challenge. We need to change that mindset. So how do you begin to talk about that? So let's even say, for example, you have someone with mental health in your family. What, how do you get the courage to say, I support mental health because someone in my family is affected? I focus it, talk, say it as it is. I don't believe in that covering up because mm. covering up does not encourage help seeking behavior and it adds to the statistics of the suicide. Because mm. if we keep covering up, if we keep not listening to people and we allow people that are affected to keep internalizing, we will definitely have, as we are seeing now, an increased rate in the suicide rate. So we need to understand that speaking out, talk, saying it as it is, seeking for help from the right places, the right people, mm -hmm. and of course the right time, mm -hmm. that would definitely you know, help us in changing the narrative and building the culture of compassion and you know, um, letting people go through and successfully in the pathway to recovery in getting help. Mm. So when, when celebrities are speaking about their mental health um, situation, yes, how do you think that affects the society at large? Oh, a lot. A lot. <laughs> I mean, what do people in your industry say when people are saying when No, we are happy about because, you know, these are people that have large followership. Mm. These are people that are thought leaders in their different industries. These are people that are change makers. So when they come out boldly and say, look, I've got depression. I've been battling depression for the past five days or five years. I have a therapist. I've been on some medication. Some of them are medications. It really encourages that person out there like, oh, wow, I thought he, he had it all together. So if he can come out, who am I not to come out? Mm, so mm. it encourages people to come out. And we want that to take place in Nigeria. We want more people that are dealing with these challenges to come out. We want people to stop shaming people. We know the social media is free for all, for, all, for people to say, but we need to be more sensitive to when people say, this is what is going on with me. We should be we should not be quick to judge. We should not banish the person and say, look, we are just seeking for attention. Sure. It's not attention. Like people that come, that die from suicide, people be, sometimes think that they are seeking for attention. Talking to somebody who may be suicidal and say, look, I think you're having this problem. You may be dealing with this. It's a good preventive measure because suicide is preventable. Mm. And talking about it does not make the person you no know, go commit suicide. It rather helps in telling the person, look, I care, I understand what you're going through, and help is available, I'm going to help you get help.
And locally, what celebrities are you working with to raise awareness? And have you seen any celebrities step out that have impressed you with how they've embraced their mental I've, health? I've seen some celebrities, like when we talked about uh, Tony Burden and, and mm -hmm. Kate Spade and Mochi that came out yesterday, and people were tagging me and they're like, okay, I said, okay, maybe I would just have to reach out to her to see how she can put a face, you know, like creating more awareness, like me supporting her and she like helping us in, you know, um, creating more awareness and advocacy on this. So they may not reach out to people like us working in this field, but we own it to them to reach out to them to say, look, this is what we do. And because we have spoken out openly, can we work together in getting more people to speak out, in getting more people, in encouraging more people to go seek for help? We are a very prayerful country, we know. Mm -hmm. We love mm -hmm. all, you know, we pray, we are all the, but the truth is that the spirit that led us to pray, she also need us to go seek for help while we do that. <laughs> that yes, is true. That because is we true. need two good heads are better than mm -hmm. one. So mm -hmm. that we will stop, you know, having that issue that it's a spiritual attack, somebody is doing me, no one is doing you. We need to understand that things happen to people. We need to understand that, like I keep saying, Depression is not a, a decision, it's a disorder. Mm. So when we are going through a depressive episode, you can get help. And the first line of treatment is counseling and therapy. It does not necessarily mean that you must take medication. Can counseling be integrated into, since we're a very religious yeah. country, mm -hmm. is there a way that we can Spiritual integrate counseling. that? Yes, and, I mean, but besides that, how do we integrate it and then get the, get our churches or mosques uh, to recommend meant. further help? For me, uh, our, our, our religious organization play a very big role when it comes to our mental health. Because it's a public health problem, we need them to be able to preach that belief system where they can tell the followers that, look, this is as important as your mental health, your physical health, rather. And then, look, we are here, we can pray, we can fast, but the truth is that when you are going through depression, what one thing you love to do, which is your interest, if it's prayers, at that point you may not be able to pray. That doesn't mm. make you a bad person. That doesn't make you. That doesn't make it seem, make you look as if God has forsaken you. We can pray for you. We can fast for you. We will, you know, we give you that spiritual counseling, but you may need more than that. Mm. So you can go seek for help. And then these are the available places that you can go seek for help. So we need them to be able to help us. We need them to change the narrative for us. They play a huge role. Because when you're in distress, actually, where do you go to? Prayers. Oh gosh, yes. And then medication. Yes. So uh, but most people go to prayer houses first. So you, 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 when people say, oh, the churches and monks are filled up these days, they say, yeah, because people are in distress. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. when they help mm -hmm. in ensuring and giving products to come that, look, we are here, we can pray, but sometimes you need more than these prayers, I, I think that would play a very major role. Wow. In, 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 in the mental health advocacy here in Nigeria. Thank you. Once Thank you. <laughs> it's time now for a break on the morning show, but when we return, Dr. May and I will be talking about the signs to look out for.